Welcome to the Farming on Purpose podcast, a podcast for farmers and ranchers ready to shift for a stronger future. Today's challenges in agriculture are new, but the grit and determination required to be successful are not. On the Farming on Purpose podcast, you'll hear how producers of all sizes and practices are moving mountains for things they believe in, all in the name of an industry that keeps growing and innovating for a stronger food system and stronger farm families. I'm your host, Lexi Wright, and I'm excited to discuss where producers are finding success, challenging the status quo, striving for better, and keeping our heritage alive, all while producing the food we depend on. Welcome back to Farming on Purpose. Today, I'm here with Jessica Perez, and I'm so excited to have her here to share her story. Um, Now, Jess, as you go by, is from Arizona originally, fifth generation farmer there, um, and has a very rich history of agriculture there. I'm excited to hear a little bit more about that. diving into the cotton and cattle industry. And then you and your husband left Arizona for your husband's law career and came to Alabama. Um, So when you did that, you got to buy a ranch that was in disrepair, uh, which I think a lot of folks dive into agriculture or beginning farming by finding those kind of opportunities. (laughs) As you guys have developed that, you guys have grown a ton. I've been enjoying seeing all the things that you share online about that. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, your history in agriculture, what ignited the passion for it, and then what that journey to Alabama and that new property was like. Yeah, I, it's, it's so fun for me to look back like on my life and what it looked like just because um I loved growing up on a farm like it was everything that made me me like I always felt like 100% myself I was never that person that was like can't wait to get out of this town because you know it was a small small farming town that was never me um but you know in the 80s and 90s everybody's parents was like, you got to go to college, go to college, you you got to get out of this town. And so uh, growing up, I always knew in the back of my head, I'm like, I can't have this forever. That was the idea behind it is you can't, my dad would always say it's a dying, it's a dying career, you can't do it, you've got to go to college, you've got to get a degree. And so I just knew I was going to grow up, I was going to marry someone from the city, I was going to end up there. And I just had to like, give it up. And um I didn't realize how how sad that made me, but I was able to, you know, compartmentalize it. You tuck it away. You say, and, and I think a lot of people have done that. Like the more women that I meet online, they say, yeah, I grew up on a farm too. And I, you know, I had to let it go. And I was like, yeah, so many of us did. And it was, it's just, I think it's a part of life. I think it's something you have to do. So I never saw this coming. I never saw having the opportunity to come back full circle and to continue that. Um, I remember loving hearing my grandparents' stories of, you know, what it was like to farm when they farmed. I, like I said, I enjoyed, we did it as a family growing up so much. And so um, as as we got kind of settled in Alabama I, and I was, I had left a, a lab career in Arizona. So I also became a stay-at-home mom when we, when we moved to Alabama. And so as we got kind of settled in that, I just kept thinking about my kids. And I thought if I could just give them a little bit, like if I could just give them a taste. Um, And that's when I started online marketing because I thought I'm here at home. Let me do online marketing. I can raise my kids and earn a cash. And I'm like, I just am going to get them a couple of cows. Like I just, if we could just have that taste, like let's do that. Um, And then in 2020, we found this. And like you said, I don't think anybody starting out now can walk in and get a a nice brand. (laughs) It's hard enough to find one that's busted up, you know, and try to rebuild it. Um, so yeah, so we we started that and um we we started kind of slow, but even when you start slow, I think uh the my biggest eye opening thing in this whole process was I thought I knew what I was doing because born and raised in the dirt doing it. But there's a big difference between going from a helping hand, you know, like labor on the farm to management and labor. And so uh, that has been the biggest eye opener 
Um, but yeah, we have learned a lot and we have, we have loved it. Uh, since then, my husband has stepped away from his law career. And so we're focusing on the ranch full time. Um, and he went from being the biggest steady boy of all time to he, he he's in it now. He loves it. <laughs> That's awesome. I think it's that like millennial era in us that is like stubborn of like, you told me I couldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway and prove you wrong. (laughs) I think that's in so many women that I, same as you see sharing their stories of like a journey back to agriculture that they always wanted to have. And we're told, no, you cannot. Yeah, it's a big pool. I mean, and you can't, you can't stop it. You can't, you really can't. Um, so when you guys moved to Alabama and found that farm, what was that like? Did it just come up out of the blue or were you searching for it? What was that? Well, OK, so we're from like the Arizona farming and um, it, farming in Arizona is rough because it's there's never any water. And so um, there's farmers are always looking for water. And I remember even when I was a little, little girl, um, my dad would always be sitting and looking at properties where it rained. <laughs> and so when we moved to Alabama, he had, I don't think he had ever even looked online at like any, and he would just like daydream about it. He would just like see what was out there and just think, man, what if water just fell from the sky? <laughs> and so, um, anyway, so he's the one that called me and was like, look at this. Um, and the ranch had, the reason it had fallen in disrepair, it was an active ranch, but um, the gentleman who was running it had Alzheimer's and dementia. And so he was in and out of whether or not he could take care of it. Um, but one of the things that he um, would not let go of is that he would not parcel it out. So we're we're in a rapidly developing area. And so um, he could have had the opportunity to parcel it out and make so much more money. Um, but thank goodness he was old and stubborn, you know, like they all are and didn't want to let it go. And so it sat for a long time. Um, and so they, they had to reduce the price significantly. Um, you know, in 2020, uh, interest rates were also amazing. Anyway, so that's kind of how it all fell into place. Yeah. And that's how we stumbled on it. Because we weren't actively even looking, but then, you know, so then my husband had to sit down and really think about it and be like, this is a big undertaking to take on. But it was kind of one of those opportunities where you're like, we jump now or nothing. Like yeah. it's now or never. And so we chose now. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing when you do find those old timers like that who are so committed to making sure that that tradition lives on, even if it's not in their own family, that he was able yeah. to do that for you guys. Yeah. Yes. I know. It's such a blessing. It's been such a blessing. That's amazing. Um, so what does farming there look like for you guys? What all do you run? What do you do? Okay. So right now we're just cattle. Um, and we we might diversify that a little bit down the road. Um, but I, I think my toxic trait is jumping it. Like I just told you our whole story. Like we're like, okay, let's go. Like <laughs> this is our chance. Um, I have a hard time doing things slowly. And and so there's a lot of hard lessons that you learn when you decide just to jump full in. Um, but I'm really trying to exercise restraint and just stick to cattle until we get, you know, good at it. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just, we, we run a cow calf operation and we just have transitioned actually this week is our launch week of selling beef directly to consumers. And we're really excited about that. Like we're anxiously waiting for people to receive their packages now, like today and tomorrow. So we're very excited about that. Um, but yeah, we're we're just doing beef and now we're doing beef direct to consumer. That's really exciting. That's a big jump to make. And I don't think most people who haven't like looked into it or yeah. tried to do it don't realize yeah. how big of a jump that is to make. Uh, yeah. I want to get to that. But before we get there, I want to not skip over a little part of your story that you shared there where you said you when you guys moved there to Alabama you decided to become a stay-at-home mom and do online marketing what that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people so what does that look like for you um so what it looked like for me was I started to share like affiliate links just to get sales commissions on products that I would share um it was, I, I had tried a lot of different things. Like I, I say that I just like intentionally started online marketing, but that's not the truth. 
Um, what I what I did was I was like, you know, I got that college degree. My dad told me go get one. I went and got one. So let's use it. And so um, I continued to work with the laboratory that I was working with in Arizona for a little while, finishing up some projects. Um, I graded SAT essays online at home. Um, I taught English as a second language to kids in China early in the mornings online. Um, what else did I do? Oh, I, I tried transcription. So I was looking for any way to make income, uh, you know, at home with my kids. Um, and I just had this gut feeling one day that I needed to look into online marketing and I, oh, I hated it. And so if I could share one thing actually with the farmers that listen to this, like if they are looking for another cash flow, I just know like in talking to my family, because a lot of my family is still involved in agriculture and they all look at what I do when I when I market the farm online and I share that journey. They're like, oh, I would never. And I'm like, well, you know what? It pays the bills while you're trying to <laughs> get your farm on, you know, your farm on its feet kind of thing. So I'm so grateful that I started that back in 2015. 2015, 2016, I started um, online marketing um, and just sharing products that I loved and earning commissions on those things. It was something that I could do during nap times or, you know, during regular time and build that up and just practicing, you know, strengthening that muscle of being able to share parts of my life and have it, you know, be an extra income. Um, But even now, like, I called my husband today and I was like, Hey, when you're feeding the cows, could you just grab some footage? Because we don't do chores for free around here. Um, and so if that'd be the one thing I'd share is that I know that it is super common for people in agriculture to think nobody cares about my daily chores that I'm doing every day. And what's the point? And, um, I wish I could just like shake all their shoulders and be like, People want to see it. I, the majority of my followers on social media have nothing to do with agriculture. They have no desire to have, to take part in agriculture, but they love the show. They love to watch what goes on behind see, the scenes of their food. Um, and they like to see just like the day to day. And, and I notice I'll watch other people who are sharing, you know, farming do the same thing every day, like their chores every day. And I watch it every day. And I love it. Um, Cause people will tell me all the time, they're like, I have nothing to do with farming, but I love watching this. Um, so for them to just practice sharing their day-to-day operations um, and just the emotions that go with it, like you really can bring a substantial income in that supports you fulfilling a dream. Like we wouldn't be able, uh, I, I won't get into that right now, but the transition from selling at the stockyard versus selling direct to consumer would not have been possible if I didn't have multiple streams of income coming in from online marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, That's wonderful advice and insight into that. A lot of folks don't understand how that all works. They, you know, they see the content, they consume the content, but it Mm -hmm. doesn't, they don't understand how the pieces fit together. So thank you for explaining that. Um, One thing that I, I didn't plan on talking about this today, but one thing that I think a lot of folks when they see that struggle with is that privacy factor that you mentioned of folks like I would never do that or I people would find it boring. It's also like figuring out what parts of your life to share and what parts of your life feel good to share. Have you faced that at all or what's your experience? Both in time. I've made a lot of mistakes of things that I did share that I wished I hadn't. And um, I think they were important lessons to learn. Um, what I have learned in theory, a lot of different things and very candidly is that everybody online, their grandpa never had that happen. <laughs> their grandpa, who was a rancher, never made that mistake. And so you're, you know, they think I'm an absolute idiot and their grandpa never made the mistake. And it kind of went, especially when I was like just trying to get my confidence in running my own ranch to have people say that. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I am an absolute idiot. But now that years have gone by, I'm like, you're so full of it. That <laughs> did happen to your grandpa. It happens to all of us. Like, yeah. we don't even know. Just because your grandpa didn't tell you that story doesn't mean it didn't happen. But um, so I have just learned that uh, before I post anything, I can just stop and I and I know how people will react. So I can intentionally choose my words to share. And then sometimes I just know, yeah, I have to take a little bit of a beating just to spread the word so that 
that, that, that people who are sharing false narratives about agriculture don't, aren't the only ones with a microphone. And I think that that's important too. Yeah, definitely. Having someone out there who is willing to share the other side of the coin is so valuable. And I think knowing what your purpose is for sharing that content is huge too. Like you understand you might take a beating or there might be lots of people who come into the comments and say negative things, but you know why you're sharing it or who you're sharing it for. And it's not those people. It's the people who hear it. Right, right. It's so true. And I've had a lot of people who have expressed gratitude for getting to see the the other side, you know, the behind the scenes of farming, just to see how emotionally invested people in agriculture are. Um, I, I think that that is super important. Like they need to see that it's not just the hard work sacrifices that are being made. It's the emotional attachment sacrifices that are made like on a day to day basis. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we talk a lot about it's the money and it's the hard work, yeah. but it's not no. just that. It's the mindset and it's the it, lifestyle too. So, yeah. That's uh, funny because every time I call my dad in tears to be like, I, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. And he said, too bad you're just in it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly I am. Yeah. <laughs> Take a look at the bank account. It'll tell a different story. I know. I know. If I was here for the money, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I'm so glad you could join us today. You can support the mission of the Farming on Purpose podcast and be part of the tribe dedicated to building ag legacies at farmingonpurpose.com slash shop. You'll find apparel, office supplies, stickers, planners, and more, all inspired by the people living out ag legacies every day. Um, well, you also mentioned some other things that you tried before you got into affiliate marketing. Do you want to yeah. share a little bit about your experience with that? I know a lot of women in agriculture who are looking to add some other streams and yeah. come into um, streams of income to the farm. Consider those. Though I was smiling to myself as you mentioned the ones that you tried because I'm like, those are the ones that I looked into as well. So what was your experience there? Um, fairly good. I didn't like the transcription and it, maybe it was the company that I worked with, but, um, you really had to, I I sat down one time and and I figured out my hourly wage that I was earning. And I think it was like three cents. And I was like, I wanted to throw up. (laughs) Oh my God. Oh, Um, And some of the things uh, were like teaching English, a second language worked. It was great, but I, I got really lucky there and I got in there early. I I recommended it to a bunch of my mom friends, you know, after, but uh, it filled up pretty quickly. And so even when they started like six months after I did, a lot of the schedules were already full and so they couldn't find classes to teach. So it wasn't as lucrative for them. Um, but it worked great for me. Um, I don't even know if they do that. I heard recently, I think they may have gotten like, like some regulations may have limited on what they can even do. I don't even know if that is a, a viable option anymore. I'm pretty sure grading SAT essays is still a viable option. You needed a bachelor's degree to do that. Um, and the pay per hour was great. I want to say it was at least $15 an hour. And that was five or six years ago. Maybe it was 20. It was pretty good. You could only get a four hour shift. So it was definitely a part-time job, but the income was good. And I, um, you did have to be actively working during those four hours. So I know that when my kids were home, like I was like handing snacks out and like reading essays at the same time. And <laughs> so that was, that part was stressful. It was not like a nap time only job or set your own schedule. That one. Um, so that was that one. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks for sharing you what your experience was. I think it's nice for people to just have options that they can look into because yeah. other streams of income on the farm absolutely help in every way. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So going back to you guys' ranch um, and you guys are just recently shifting to direct to consumer sales. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about what that shift has been like when you started planning for it. What inspired yeah. you to do it? Well, I think... It was the first time that I went to drop off a load of calves at the auction. And I was like, hey, someone better take good care of them. Like, where are they going? Like, I needed to like geotag them. And just see. So I could like call the rancher and be like, you're being, you're treating them good, right? Um, and so that was like a wake up call to me where I'm like, oh my gosh, I might be a complete control freak, but I want to control this entire process. And I just, 
I don't know. I just loved the idea of it. I loved being able, yeah, to control that whole process and just to, and I'm not really creating it. So it sounds dumb to say like something I created because I mean, I don't create it. God created it, but that I had a hand in, that I was a steward in actively. Um, that just, it just rang true to me. I just really wanted to do it like from, from the get go. Um, and my dad has been mentoring me this whole time, like very involved in mentoring me. He's probably sick of me calling him 50 times a day. And he, and I told him I wanted to do this from the beginning. He's like, no, you gotta slow down. And, and, and so our plan was at the five year mark that we would, um, slowly try to transition into direct. And so we're at three and a half years. And so I don't know exactly how I, I still managed to get my way <laughs> because I am that stubborn. Um, but it's good. It's a slow transition. I think in my mind, I was going to have like this huge grand opening and all of a sudden all of our cattle, you know, we're, we're, we're in our, in our beef program and we were going to finish them all. And it was all going to be, you know, in the hands of people. Um, but what it's actually looking like is, um, so for those who don't know, um, when you run a cow calf operation on a ranch and you, you are, you are weaning calves at a certain weight and taking them to the auction and you're getting a paycheck same day for those cattle. Um, and so you can establish a cash flow knowing, you know, when cows are going to be ready to transition to a direct consumer, you are not only interrupting that cash flow because you're not taking them to the auction anymore. So there's a lack of cash flow coming in, but you're investing so much more money into those cows. So you're not only getting less money in, you're going to be putting so much money more into it, not only carrying them um, on the property. So they're eating your grass, they're eating your hay. And then to grain finish them, you're also investing in quite a bit of feed um, to feed them on a daily basis, you know, that last portion of their life. Um So that was a big wake up call for me, just how much capital and investment it was going to take to carry any of them uh, to finish. Um, And so what that's looked like for us this year, if you're in ranch, you also know that uh, the market prices have been phenomenal this year. And so we had to make some very difficult decisions this year just based on market prices to say, we can't pass up the opportunity to to sell our cattle at auction. Um, And so... I, I had a pretty large group of of cattle that I was going to finish myself, and we end up selling about seventy five percent of that group uh, to auction. And so, what that done though is it it has provided us a little bit of wiggle room so that I can carry a little bit more later this year. Um, and so, like right now, uh, my and our direct consumer, we we had two steers that we had finished and processed, and that's what we're selling right now. And we won't have another batch of steers ready probably until like August or September. So um, it's going to be a slow transition, but I'm kind of glad that we're doing it this way because it's given us a lot of time to learn all the little quirks and work out all the bugs in the system and all of those kinds of things. So that's kind of how we're transitioning. Absolutely. I We just talked about this with the guests that I had on the podcast last week about the market prices right now and how that's a, a big decision because, you know, you've worked so hard to get to the point where you can finish them out yourself, mm-hmm. but it would be a very silly business decision to pass up on that amount of profit just mm-hmm. because, you know, that was your plan. I uh, know. I know. And Herbert, it hurt my feelings so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Plans in cattle are always subject to change. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's super exciting. Congratulations on you. your first boxes going out um, of you. beef to customers. That's really exciting. Um, and doing it early ahead of schedule. That's even, even cooler. I think it's yeah. interesting um, in agriculture we really try to put more stages of the market together at once early. You know, like you guys are are smaller and you're trying to um, do the direct-to-consumer thing, which is taking on multiple phases of the production process and combining them all, consolidating them into one business. Most businesses don't do that until they are big and they've mastered one phase of the process. Then they're like, okay, we'll try to cut out a middleman on either side by absorbing that, that cycle. But you guys are doing it all at once when you're smaller. Um, Gosh, when you put it like that, it stresses me out. I'm like, holy cow, now that's hard to do. <laughs> it is. And I, that's what I want people to know is like, it's, it's not 
what is normally done in business. So it's a huge thing that you guys are taking on, but going to pay off for years to come, I'm sure, because you're building your own marketing avenue. You're not relying on other things. So lots of upfront investment, but hopefully that investment is then there for you guys to rely on for a long, long time. Um, Yeah. So when you guys um, are looking at your orders for the fall and kind of planning that out, talk a little bit about how you are selling the cuts of beef that you have now and then planning for marketing the ones that you'll have maybe in the fall. Um, So my current plan is I'm, and I'm really, really excited about it. So um, I actually mentor quite a few women on showing up on social media and doing, you know, their own marketing, marketing themselves, marketing other products. And so uh, I'm very grateful for that experience that I have in doing that because um, this is the first time of all of the products that I've marketed over the last couple of years. I've never like, I'm just so excited to do this because then you finally get to market for yourself. Um, But I know that you focus on family a lot. And I just, I mentor so many women who say, I, I'm just a boring mom. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that phrase. Like, I don't do anything cool. I'm just a boring mom. And um, and I always had like those functions of being a mom. Like we all do the same stuff, you know? And just as like a little sidebar, if you are a mother and you do feel that way, like I would bet you $10 right now, if I told you that I found the best laundry detergent out there, you would be dying to know what it was, Okay. We all speak the same language. We're all look like, and 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 we love it. Like that's something we're like, oh my gosh, tell me because that's something that's very involved in my my day to day. Um, and so I feel like moving forward as we market for the beef, what I'm so excited about doing is, you know, how many dinners have I made over the last 12 years of being a mother? Um, I'm so excited to I, what I want to do is create a um, like a monthly meal plan to where somebody could buy beef from us once a month and I can have a box that they get of, of those cuts of beef that will supply, you know, like say two meals of beef per week for a whole month. They get their beef at the beginning of the month and then I have the recipes and the plan for those meals during the month. Um that's, I'm like, I have stars in my eyes about it. I'm so excited. That's All those years of making incredible. dinner, I, now I can like talk about it. Ah, it was worth it. I need to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, okay. I have to ask, do you have any employees for the cattle, the marketing, that kind of side of the business? I, we don't currently know. Okay. That's no. amazing because I mean, you're talking well, if you about thought how dirty my house was, you wouldn't be as amazed because my same. gosh, don't look over there. <laughs> same, 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 same. <laughs> right. um, but that's incredible. That's a, a whole other sector. Like we don't often think about that as well, that you're not only like you guys are cow calves, so you are not buying calves. You're raising your own calves. You're finishing your own calves. You are then, I'm assuming, taking it to a USDA locker you're not butchering yourself, right? Or you're not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you are marketing them and you're also doing like a whole other product value add as you put these meal kit things together. Like, I, I don't know how you're doing it all. How are you doing it all? Well, we have had ha- help in the past. I will say that. So um, we've had two different farm hands at two different times, but they were just, they needed work for a short amount of time. So um, we used to have help on the farm, but I do think that we will need help moving forward. But um, one of the things before we even started the farm was like, I loved growing up that we got to share the farm with people, other people, you know, as it was a social thing as well. People do like to get out of town. Like every time I drive to the ranch, I drive by, I call it a fake farm, but basically it's a restaurant that's market itself as a farm. They have some chickens that run around and, and it's always packed and my kids asked to go and I'm like why we have a real part <laughs> anyways but what I have noticed and I'm very grateful so if any of my friends listen to this podcast like I am so grateful but um we have discovered like our friends are they love to come help so like on big cattle working days there's only been one cattle working day where it was just me and my husband and like one kid two kids helped and they're 10 and 11 10 and 12 so I mean it's not like they're big grown men, you know, they're, they're little boys still. Um, 
That was so hard. I That was a big eye opener that I'm very grateful for the friends that have come to help, but they love it. Like they'll ask us, hey, when are you guys working cattle next? We want to come help. So we have had friends that just show up. They'll, the, you know, whole families will come, their babies in tow, all the kids will be playing off in the pasture. And, you know, the husbands and wives will take turns coming over to help with the cattle. Um, and so we've had a lot of help in that way. Um, and then my parents are partially retired. And so um, my sister and brother-in-law, they run um, an agriculture operation. It's multifaceted too, but they run an operation in Arizona and that was my dad's farm then. And so, you know how old farmers are, they don't let go. And so um, he, he helps, he, he's, he, he still has his, he wants to, you know, no one can do it like they can do it in the best way. And so he, he helps out with them and then he'll come out and he gets to come out. And this is like, kind of like their partial retirement. So the ranch out here for him is easy because literally you don't even have to water the grass. The rain just falls. And it's literally his then dream that I told you he gets to come out and sit on the back porch and watch it rain and watch the grass grow with no intervention. It's like a miracle to him. Um, and so they'll come out for chunks of time and he'll he'll put his eyes on the ranch and he'll tell me what we need to get caught up on. And him and my mom are the hardest working people I know. And so they always jump in and help us do a lot of things too. So we have had a lot of help, a lot of help, but we don't have any hired help. That's incredible though. A lot of beginning ranchers um, or for people who are you know starting out on their own for the first time, that's one of the biggest things they struggle with because either they don't have... Um, the previous generations to come and give that insight and give that help or, you know, they just, they're just not local. They've had to move because of access to land and that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's incredible yeah. that you guys have solved for that problem with friends and then that your parents are also able to come out. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So as you guys are thinking about the future and what things look like into next year, what are you most excited about? Um, I think I'm most excited to see where we can we can take this of just having it be because I feel like um, we were we were heavily focused on our other careers like what we were doing and so the farm was in in the background you know it was something that we enjoyed doing and and I feel like our eyes have been opened that like we can do this and so our main focus can be on the farm and do selling beef direct. And so, like I said, it will be slow because like we let, we you gotta let, you gotta let the cows grow. So okay. I, I can't speed that up. Well, I guess you could, but we don't. So uh, we gotta, you just gotta be patient for that. But over the time, I guess I'm excited just to see where it goes, like to have people taste the beef. Cause I've realized that that's something that I feel very uh, vulnerable about is to share that, you know, like, oh my gosh, like I raised that. Are you like, I hope you like this, is my baby. I hope, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about, um, I don't know, just connecting with people on another level when it comes to food. And um, what I have noticed though, as, as I've kept my eyes on other uh, beef people that sell direct, is that there's certain cuts of meat that don't sell as rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to kind of tackle that head on by sharing recipes to educate people on how to use those cuts of beef. Um, the, I think that's like on my top list of things that I am excited about, like in the fall. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's incredible. You sound like me when anybody asks me like uh, what a year down the road is like, I'm like, I I don't know. It's it's all exciting because things change so fast. I have no idea what it's going to look like. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You're like you're asking me what, like, I don't even know what I'm going to do for lunch, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, you mentioned that your husband stepped away from his law career and is focusing on the ranch now. What did that transition look like for you guys? That's, you know, a lot of people's dream to have more, like, yeah. both spouses or both partners at home yeah. working on the ranch. Yeah. Um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't direct, like it wasn't directly correlated. It, like he did not leave his law career to become a rancher. And I think that that was a common misconception, even amongst his friends and family. Cause they were all like, what? Like, <laughs> what did you do that? Um, so that was a common misconception. Um, it ended up just being that, um, his law career wasn't 
it wasn't conducive to the family life that he wanted to have. Um, like we, we sat down and we talked and he said, you know, cause he got offered a partnership position. And so we were at a crossroads. And so we had to sit down and he said, you know, I can do this. Like we can do this. I can further my career. Um, but our kids were all really little still. Um, and he knew that in the transition phase of becoming a partner, um, while he was still like having to go to court and things like that, that it would require, you know, a couple hours every evening too of work too. And so, and he knew, you know, he would be traveling a lot. And so it just came down to, he said, our kids are little, they'll never be little again, but I could build a law career again later. And uh, just financially, I told you, I had picked up as many streams of income as I could. And so we, we just looked at the numbers and we're like, okay, let's just do it. So if, if technically he took a step back to be a dad, that's what he stepped away from. But then he was more available to help me like with the paperwork part of the farm, because I mean, literally after he, like his last day of work, I handed him a laundry basket that was just full of envelopes and papers. And I was like, here you go. This was like, listen, he's like, oh my gosh, what has been happening? Am I I'm not good at that? Like, that's gotta be you. I'm more like marketing and I like to go outside. I don't really like to sit at the computer and do papers. Um, and so he, that's what he started out with. He was just going to help me get the the paperwork part of all of our lives put back together and be available for our kids. So like now he's like, he's, he's the financial PTA guy at the school. Um, and so that's, that was like the main focus when he, when he stepped away. But um, and I think it's because he didn't have the farm. Like he was like the odd man out kind of, you know, like he didn't, he didn't grow up on a farm and you would hear me and my dad talking and he'd be like, uh, you know, kind of left out maybe. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, but uh, now that he's like literally gotten his feet wet and, and dove in, like now he's like in it, in it. So um, he's, and again, he did, he built our website and he's, he's been running numbers. And so now he has stepped into that role where we've had to have more discussions. And so now I'm like, okay, like now we're, you're in it. You're a rancher now. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if to Kansas it next. But, oh, I'm sorry. What? You can send him to Kansas next. He can work on my laundry basket of paperwork. <laughs> and I don't even know if he ever got through the whole thing, you know? <laughs> oh, my life. I think that it's just, why do you have to do the paperwork? Why does farming require so much paperwork? That is like the biggest... I don't know. It's, it's a travesty. It shouldn't happen. <laughs> I mean, especially in the spring when it's nice outside. Like, I, there is no chance that I'm going to do, do that. That's just me. It's just not nice. It's like, oh, my bird. <laughs> well, um, you have three kiddos, correct? I have four. Four kiddos. Okay. Um, what has having them on the farm and watching them grow up throughout this process been like? Uh, really good. So like me thinking back to my childhood, it was like amazing. Like I loved it. I always wanted to go to the farm with my dad. Like I always, whatever. Um, you know, but there's lots of times when we go down to do chores and they're like, Ugh! and it was like, oh, no, this is magical. <laughs> Dude, anyway, so no, there it's, it, it's been really, really good. Um, it makes me emotional. Like my daughter um, was a bait, like 18 months when we got the farm. So she'll never not know what it's like to be around cattle. And that just like, it, that makes me so happy. Um, and it's been really good for my boys. Like they, it's, it's just been good. They've had a, I, they they had a lot of responsibility put on them at times. Like even when, you, you know, even when you're in charge of the gates, like, to have multiple adults screaming at you to like shut that gate right now or open that gate and shut the other one you know to have I guess it's a life skill <laughs> to be able to withstand you know that much pressure um that's been good to see and they, they handle it like like every time we get done I'm like wow you handled that really well like I'm I'm really proud of you and what your job was so important um uh, I've also enjoyed that they've got to see the hardest parts of ranching like they've been with me when I've had full on breakdowns, you know, over taking care of a calf. And um, so I'm sure your followers, your listeners don't know, but on our ranch, we have a calf that had uh, had a dog attack and lost her ears. Um, and it was gruesome. And to be honest, we probably should have put her down. And I, and I like literally told my mom that I said to make this 
yeah, suffer through the healing process of this. Like, I don't know if I want to put her through that. Like, let's just, let's just not make her suffer. And my mom was like, no, she deserves a chance. And so we gave her a chance. And it was a really long and hard recovery, but I got to see my kids see that part of humanity and watch them show up in a big way, like even my little, little girl, you know, she would stand there and stroke this cast neck who had like oozing wounds off her face and say, you're so beautiful. You're doing such a good job. I'm just like, oh, and so it's been, that has been so good for me. And I love having a daughter in the mix too, because um, nobody even outright told me, but when I was a little, little girl, I just thought, well, I'm, I'm the, I'm the girl in the dirt, you know, like I, I'm not, I can't be girly and a farmer at the same time. So I fully embrace that I'm the girl in the dirt, you know? Um, But my daughter is the girliest little thing that you've ever known, but is obsessed with frogs and snails and like loves her cows. Like she's doing it all. And I love that like she gets to experience doing it all and being it all, like just whatever she feels like being. Like that means the world to me. I completely agree. I have one of my daughters is very similar. She did dance recital last weekend. um, And that very same day she was in the creek and like, oh, mom, there's a snake over there. And (laughs) she's like, not a lot. Yes, not a big deal. Um, But it's so cool to be able to give them the opportunity to just be okay with doing both sides of that. Um, And yes, I love that you said that having kids involved and being yelled at and doing really important jobs is such a life skill. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. to think that most kids their age would absolutely crumble under that kind of pressure and they are taking it on and maybe not always doing it perfectly and not always like getting through it without tears. Like that's a good oh, number. Lots of tears. But, uh, all around. <laughs> definitely something they're going to look back at later and, and realize the value of. So yeah. That's awesome. Um, now you mentioned that you know, being able to embrace being a woman in agriculture has taken time. I love that you now do makeup videos while you talk about agriculture. Um, (laughs) What is that? Like, what made you decide that you wanted to put yourself out there in that way and and really embrace the femininity and the fact that you guys are ranchers? That probably was the hardest part because in my head, I even had to convince myself that the two could coexist because for a long time, I just felt so fake doing it because I was like, no, this is not allowed. Like this is not allowed because it's, it's dumb. It's pointless. You know, all those things would go through my head. Um, and so it's been interesting. I actually just got a message from a lady that lives in Florida that her daughter just started college and she just started a club at her college to embrace femininity in agriculture. Like, and all of them get dolled up and they are the ag program at their college. And she's like, I think she might, you know, want to call and pick your brain sometimes. And I'm like, I cannot believe I'm having this conversation right now, like at all. And so, um, honestly, like I, I, I kind of approached it because I got so much, uh, pushback like the first time I ever did apply my makeup um, with livestock around, um, I got a lot of pushback, people telling me that it was like, they were literally all those voices in my head saying, you know, this is, this is stupid. This is pointless. Why would you do that? So we melt it off in two hours. The, the cows don't care. My pigs don't care. Um, what a waste, you know, that's gross. Um, you don't need all that. Like, like literally I, I heard it all. Um, and there's something about somebody verbally telling you all the stuff that was already in your head to be like, mm, no. <laughs> and so, oh, really? Because now I'm going to say it louder. And so um, I just, I, I think the reason, the main reason I show up and do it now is just to illustrate that like you can do both and that, and there, I know that there's so many women out there now that they were that version of me that said like the two can't coexist. Like I'm just a... I'm a farm girl. I just, I'm in the dirt. I don't do the girly girl stuff and say, Hey, you want to try, you can try it. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) So yeah, absolutely. It's okay to do both things and and let your soul be lit up in multiple ways. And yeah, I love the breaking down. Yeah. Yeah. I love the breaking down of the stereotypes there. I think there's always like this underlying thing with femininity in agriculture and wanting to be taken seriously and thinking that that 
the feminine side and, and doing things like that potentially detract from that. That is so hard to overcome. But like you said, it's okay to tell yourself that in your head. But when other people say it to you, it's like, oh, no, <laughs> that is not the case. Yeah. And I'll even catch myself like I'm thinking of like when the vet comes or um, the because all of the neighboring ranchers and cowboys around me are all, you know, 50 to 60 year old men. And so whenever I'm in a just like a business conversation with them, I'll spend half of that conversation in my head saying, does he think I'm dumb because I'm wearing makeup right now? Like that literally goes through my head multiple times in the conversation. And I have to like put it to the side and be like, just engage in the conversation, like whether or not he thinks I'm dumb or, or vain or silly or whatever, like I can't care about it right now. Like I have to and like redirect my brain to just be focused on the conversation. But so I have not mastered that yet at all, like at all, at all. Um, and I got to give credit to the men that I talk to because they don't ever, none of them have ever treated me like I'm stupid. So I appreciate that. They might think I'm stupid, but they can do that privately. They don't say it to my face. <laughs> That's all that matters. <laughs> I think it's a lifetime of practice for that skill because it is a very male-dominated industry and an older male-dominated yeah. industry. And we're starting to see some shifts there, but yeah. still, most of the people that we talk to are men who have been doing it their whole life. So whole asking life. questions um, and wanting to explain or understand things more even is hard because then it's like, well, am I just the dumb girl that is along for the ride? And they actually know. call my husband. <laughs> I know. I know. So I've just, I've literally had to make a conscious decision that I have just decided that when I have those conversations with them, that, that I've decided that what they think is that, you know, as they recognize that they're getting older to have anybody younger than them have a vested interest in their passion, because you know, they're passionate about it. So to give them an opportunity to share everything that they've learned over their lifetimes and have somebody in a younger generation care, I'm choosing to believe that that's what they're, that that's what they're taking away from the conversation and that I appreciate their knowledge and that they feel appreciated. So that's what I try to focus on. But it, like, like you said, it's a lifetime of practice, but that's, that's like what I've chosen to believe because otherwise I'll just get in my head and not ask any questions because I don't want to look dumb. Mm-hmm. Um, but they do have so much more knowledge than me. So I pick their brains anytime I can. Yeah. And <laughs> sometimes that's I, what it takes. I also got lucky though, because all of those neighboring cowboys around me all have daughters almost exactly my age. So I'm like, please just imagine like I'm your daughter. Like I'm just... I'm just your daughter. Now be nice to me. <laughs> oh gosh, I love that. And and you're absolutely right. A lot of them have so much wealth of knowledge that's not going to go anywhere unless people start asking those questions. And right. even if the advice is delivered gruffly, you're yeah. still le- learning and gaining from it. So that's awesome. Right. Right. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about kind of like the big picture of things and how you guys have transitioned. I want to get into some of the nitty gritty before we wrap up today. Um, as you guys have transitioned to the direct to consumer beef, what is one like logistical or very down in the weeds thing that you have learned that you can maybe prevent somebody else from going through the same pain of learning? I would say my biggest regret though is try is is tried to raise my own replacement heifers. I like really, really wanted to do that. I really wanted to, to, to raise my own replacement heifers. And I got really emotionally attached to them. Um, and then my, my big bull just kept getting out and then he kept getting out and kept getting out. And I crossed my fingers. He didn't get to them. And then he did. So we've had nightmare after nightmare happen with that. That's been like my, and you know what? I was, I was, I was given advice at this point in my career of ranching, don't raise your own replacement heifers because it's not even a good financial decision. <laughs> so it's more financially viable to go out and buy somebody else's bred heifers and get more calves on the ground rather than waiting the extended period to raise your own replacement heifers. But I just wanted to do it so bad. And that is my biggest regret. I wish I would have just listened um, because... Yeah, it's been you know, really, that was hard. So I'm not crying. I really have to be in the job right now. Yeah, that's always, <laughs> those lessons are hard 
to learn, especially yeah. when it's like, well, I wanted to tell somebody I told you so or prove it to myself that I could do it. And I was like, yeah, that didn't work out. And it was, and, and in the times that it worked, like when we had, you know, the successes where like the mom is a good mom and she had the healthy cat, like it has been so special. Um, but I actually wouldn't trade those special times for the the hard lessons that we learned. And like, even, you know, like I'm saying, like those older men that came to help us when things were bad with the other ones that, you know, when they would tell me what went wrong, I'm like, I know though, like I knew, like I tried to keep it locked up, but the stupid thing we wouldn't, oh, I don't know why. I don't know why he was so hell bent on getting out, like during those weeks. I'm in the market for a new bull in case you're wondering. I'm so mad at him. But that has been the hardest lesson. I um this if I was when we started out, um we bought up old, old mother cows, and I I would recommend that 10 times over. Um that was that was a really good call because they were seasoned mothers. Like I didn't have any problems with anybody not claiming their calf. Um, none of them had any calving difficulty. Like they were seasoned pros. Um, and granted, they didn't have as many years left in them if I had, you know, got them younger, but like they were calm, they were easy to work with and uh, they were good mothers. And I just got it in my head that I, I wanted to switch things up. And I, and so I regret that. That would be my biggest lesson that I have learned over the last couple of years. Um, and then the other thing that has been like the biggest thing is learning, um, for your general area, what uh, what infections and uh, parasites are local to your area. So, you know, because I was getting mentored by, you know, an Arizona rancher, we follow, I, you know, I called my brothers who ranch in Arizona and they kind of talked me through their, you know, parasite protocols and things like that. And I followed those, but it wasn't exactly applicable to what's in Alabama. So we had some loss from um, some parasites that aren't even, they don't even exist in in Arizona. So um, that was the other big lesson that we had to learn. And since we tweaked that, we've seen major, major improvements. That's definitely a lesson that I feel like when you move is is a hard one to learn. Yeah. You just don't even think about it. No, no, we don't think about there being different. Yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, well, um, my husband keeps telling me that we're going to be buying some heifers. And now you're making me be like, oh, maybe we should talk about that. Some heifers. <laughs> well, I say they're like fully grown heifers. That is a good call. But I love my other heifers. I love the heifers I bought. I haven't bought any heifers that I've just like been absolutely like, oh, big mistake. I haven't yet. Yeah. Not as a group. There's been like a couple of them where I'm like, you're out of here. Yeah. But, um, as a group, no, I loved buying them. It was just raising my own. Yeah. It just, yeah. Well, and yeah. where you, you mentioned that having those mama cows that were experienced like that is hard to put a price on the fact that you aren't going to have to deal with any of that stuff. That is I got so handy. Really spoiled. I got really spoiled to just like show up to check the cows for the day and they just had a calf. No big deal. And they're nursing it like a pro. And I'm like, well, this is easy. Yes. Cabbing season is hard. Like, what's the problem? <laughs> and, then, and then I got, yeah. And then those, it was just the, those replacement heifers with my big bull. That was the problem. No. So. Well, um, you mentioned that you guys have been working on mastering the cattle side of things. Um, as you look ahead, when you kind of have that crossed off your list, what's the next addition, do you think? What are you thinking you might do first? I think I might want to do chickens, like pasture raised chickens. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. Yeah. And then we could add chicken to our boxes, but that will be down. My husband was like, pump the brakes. And I'm like, I know, I know. I'm just talking out loud. That's all. (laughs) I'm going to have something be like researching. Yeah. And I keep seeing people talking about how good pasture raised chicken tastes. And now that I've seen how good our beef tastes, I'm like, wait, chicken can taste better? (laughs) I want to play. Like, let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Well, like a couple of chickens for myself, right? First, like that. Yeah. Then you get into the chicken math situation. So gotta be careful. And I've done that before. And then that was heartbreaking when it all ended so i've told myself no i'm i'm grounded from chickens right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's too many stray dogs roaming around so i'm grounded from oh, chickens. man gosh 
Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Um, let people know where they can reach you, follow you, and what kind of special things that you have going on now, or maybe if they have a bowl that they want to sell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in the market. I have like a low birth weight. Just kidding. Um, so I'm on Instagram and TikTok. Um, the names are very similar. I don't know why I didn't do them exactly the same, but on Instagram, it's rancher.jests on Instagram. And I'm also on TikTok and it's rancher jests with no dot on TikTok. So, and then um, our, is, this is what you asked for, right? Sorry. Okay. And then uh, we just launched our website this week and it's sagebrush-farms.com. Um, and we just were selling our, our first round of beef right now. So- Perfect. And you mentioned the mentorship program. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, it right now, as it sits right now, um, I it's mostly for um, the makeup business that I have, and I directly mentor them on building their own brand. Um, but I've been talking to my husband about because I have talked to so many uh, people in agriculture that they just they can't wrap their heads around like how to market the farm. Um, I, I've been talking to him. That I'm like, I feel like I could help other people in the farming industry learn how to market their day-to-day operations to where they could have multiple, like get sponsorships. And and so you're not doing your chores for free. And um, that was the number one thing that my dad mentored me when I started. He's like, do you cannot quit your day job? Like you will not be successful enough on the farm where you can ever quit your day job. And I said, well, I'm going to double dip then. So I mean, those, and that's the, been my mantra since the beginning that every time I did a farm chore, I was going to monetize it in another way other than raising the beef. And so um, if I could help other farmers learn how to just rip the bandaid off and strengthen that muscle, like if there's interest in that, I would, I would definitely put together a course on just the lessons that I've learned over the last seven years of doing online marketing to help them reach more people. Absolutely. So if you guys are interested in any of those things, Jess is your person to reach out to. Um, Thank you so much for being here today and really enjoyed hearing your story. If you've enjoyed spending time with us today, please take a moment to review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or join the conversation on social media. Do you have a topic you would like to discuss or know someone with a story to share? Apply to be a guest on the podcast at farmingonpurpose.com. You can follow the host of Farming on Purpose, Lexi, on your favorite social media platforms for more content by searching for Farming on Purpose. And remember, if you look around your table and aren't inspired by the people there, it's time to find a new seat.